This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to the Self Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Opinions are like, well, you know the saying, everyone's got one, but there's a difference between having an opinion and holding a belief. In the late 1950s, the French tightrope walker, Charles Blondin, captivated North America with his death-defying feats. In 1859, a massive crowd gathered to witness the great Blondin attempt to cross Niagara Falls, and it was a seriously windy day. Now, Blondin had created a massive reputation for himself by doing outrageous feats across the falls. He would walk across the falls and stop and retrieve a bottle of wine from a boat passing down below with a rope and proceed to drink it and then cross, which that's really impressive. After a bottle of wine, I can't even walk in a straight line, not to mention across the falls where he once sat down on the high wire and ate an omelet. <laughs> and other times he would push a wheelbarrow across. And there was this one day that he had pushed a wheelbarrow across. They got to the other side, and there was this enormous crowd waiting for him. And as he made it across, the crowd went absolutely wild. And then he asked the question He said, Do you believe? that I can do it again. And the crowd just roared. They were like, yes, absolutely. They all had strong opinions. And why wouldn't they? They just saw this guy do the impossible. So he pulls out a wheelbarrow and he asks, do you believe I could walk back across the falls with someone in the wheelbarrow? And they all just, again, went uproarious and they had this strong belief. They were absolutely convinced that he could do it. So he asked them one more time, do you believe that I could push this wheelbarrow along the wire carrying someone? Again, uproarious excitement. Never to back down from a challenge, Blondine said, okay, if you really believe I can do it, who wants to hop into the wheelbarrow? And if this happened today and you were watching the video on YouTube, you would think that you accidentally hit the mute button. It was crickets. Every single person in that crowd had an opinion that Blondine could do it, but when it came to a resolute belief, like real belief, well, they weren't so sure. You see, opinions are easy. They're like social media likes. They're effortless and often, well, they're meaningless. But beliefs, beliefs require skin in the game. They require commitment, and they're reflected in our behaviors. Rarely, however, does it require a wheelbarrow ride over a death-defying drop. So stay safe out there. How do we know if our beliefs are really making a difference? I think it starts with self-awareness. Ask yourself this question. I know I've asked myself a version of it constantly. Are your beliefs driving positive action? Are they helping you and others around you to grow? Are they making the world better? And if not like the world better, even Dunbar's five, the five piece people that are closest to you, what's your impact on them? Because that's a reflection of your worldview. Having beliefs that make the world better sometimes requires getting uncomfortable, stepping up, and yeah, maybe even stepping into that metaphorical wheelbarrow. In any case, you know, I know that people are entitled to their opinions, granted, but maybe what the world needs is fewer opinions and more people that are just willing to get into the wheelbarrow. So why would any of us hold on to beliefs that aren't beneficial to others or, or aren't even beneficial to ourselves for that matter? Have you ever had a belief that you didn't have concrete evidence for, but you absolutely held on to it, but it made you miserable. Is it because deep down inside we're miserable or maybe we're just evil? And I think the answer is obvious. No, most of us are not. If anything, we're like the Diet Coke of evil. 
And okay, that was a bad joke, but throw me a freaking bone here. Okay, I just can't help myself today, can I? Getting back on track. <laughs> what stops people from going all in? From being committed to something that lifts up others rather than tearing them down, something that elevates ourselves in the process. I think as human beings, we're a complex mix of needs, desires, and behaviors that drive us and, well, often mystify us. Abraham Maslow, the American psychology professor, elegantly summed up the essentials of our human experience in his 1943 work, A Hierarchy of Needs. It wasn't just a dry academic exercise, it was a revelation that resonated with something deep inside of us. It was an attempt at explaining why we do what we do and why sometimes we act in ways that might seem downright counterproductive. Now, Maslow's hierarchy is more than just a tidy pyramid. It's a roadmap of our lives. It's a flawed roadmap at that, as the population that Maslow studied was rather limited. We're not all middle-aged white guys raised in Western culture deeply rooted in individualism. I mean, that does describe me, actually, but it doesn't account for other people, and it doesn't account for cultural variations, values, and priorities all that well. Not to mention, our needs don't always fit very neatly into an ascending pyramid. It's more than possible to have a deep need for artistic expression and actualization when your basic needs, like paying the bills, is a constant struggle, hence the term starving artist. But as a schematic, you have to admit, it's a valuable piece of work. The value of Maslow's hierarchy lies in its ability to provide a simplified, intuitive understanding of human motivation. It highlights the progression from basic survival needs to a more complex psychological and, and self-fulfillment needs, which can be rather useful in understanding how different aspects of our lives are interconnected. So. If you picture it as a ladder, you're constantly climbing. You're trying to reach the next lung. Or rung would be the better pronunciation of that. And once a need is satisfied, it, it opens you up to wanting to satisfy other needs. And it keeps us growing. It keeps us in, in a state of dynamic flux within our own lives in relation to one another. So you know, you've probably seen this pyramid before, but again, the base of the ladder is your most basic needs. What Maslow labeled as physiological, breathing, fairly important, food, water, sleep, and so on. These are kind of like non-negotiables. Without them, forget about solving world hunger, because your own need for substance might prove too distracting. You know, if you climb a rung, you hit safety. You know, security. It's kind of like the comfort blanket of knowing that my job is relatively secure for today. My family's healthy. There's a roof over my head. And anyone who's experienced that sinking feeling of losing a job or, or moving house knows how destabilizing this is when that rung starts to get a bit shaky. It's kind of like trying to balance on a tightrope with no net below you. So next up is the need to feel loved and to belong. These are our social needs. Having friends who tolerate our quirks, our family, members that, that love us, even when we're being insufferable. I know that's none of us, but you know, other people. Or a partner who you know, doesn't immediately reach for the remote when we start talking about our day. Um, or maybe sometimes, I don't know. But these relationships, they, they form the core of our social support system. Like Without them, it's almost like we're left adrift in the sea of loneliness. I know on my episode recently, Tiffany Cook, um, I haven't put it out yet, but I was talking about how I suspect belonging is the master need because it drives all of the other needs. And, and even our most basic needs, like physiological needs and safety throughout all of human history couldn't really be fulfilled without belonging. So anyway, you can listen to that if you like um, when the episode comes out. As you start to move higher, right, we encounter the needs for things like esteem. You know, what we're talking about here is self-confidence, feeling respected, and giving respect in return. But you know, let's be real. How often do we feel the need to prove ourselves or, or to achieve something 
that will make us feel worthy in the eyes of others and, and more importantly, in our own eyes. So is that real esteem? Is that real confidence? No, that's the need to feel important. And, and it's there to one degree or another. We all have it. If we're defined by it, that's one thing. But admitting we have it or, or even being influenced by it when our behaviors are kind of like out of character or they're not where they should be. Maybe they're hurtful to ourselves and others unintentionally. It's pretty important to be called out on that and to have that intrinsic drive that allows us to, to hear that and hopefully adapt. And then perched on the top of the pyramid or near the top is self-actualization, right? This is where things start to get interesting because here it's not just about the need to exist or exist in relation to other people, but to thrive, to really express ourselves creatively, to solve problems, to be spontaneous, and to live life fully. You know, for, for Maslow, this meant like, you know, a painter needs to paint. For some people, that means painting your next masterpiece. For others, it could be training for a marathon. And for a few brave souls, it might be diving into the chaotic adventure of parenthood. <laughs> the point is self-actualization is about becoming the best version of ourselves, whatever that might look like. And finally, you know, before Maslow died, he expanded the pyramid and crowning the pyramid is self-transcendence, the need to connect to something greater than ourselves. This is where we shift from me focus to we focus, contributing to the world in a way that transcends our own existence. Like think of it as the ultimate mic drop. You've done the work on yourself and now you're ready to change the world or at least someone else's world. So why do we do what we do? The hidden drivers of behaviors. This is what we need to look at. How do our basic human needs explain our behavior? And everything that we do, if you can imagine, is an attempt to meet one of these needs. Let's just say, I think there's more to human behavior, but this is a huge part of it. Sometimes we're, we're conscious of this, but more often than not, we're kind of operating on autopilot. And the problem arises when our behaviors become at odds with our goal. In motivational interviewing, this would be um, a discrepancy, right? That the, that the therapist or the coach tries to make you aware of. You know the drill, right? You set a goal, you make a plan, and then in a moment of weakness, you binge on a tub of ice cream. Okay, maybe not a tub, maybe just like a pint. Jeez, I'm getting ahead of myself here. You beat yourself up after that, regardless, right? Whatever it was. And you tell yourself, oh, I've got no willpower. But what if there's more to this story? What if that behavior, that self-sabotaging, as it seems, is actually fulfilling a need that you're not fully aware of? Um, Keegan and Leahy, they do some amazing work. And so they talk about sometimes when we say we want something and then we engage in a behavior that almost guarantees we're not going to get it, it's not because of lack of commitment. Our verbal commitments are in conflict with our hidden commitments. And those hidden commitments might be as strong or stronger than the commitments that we verbally state are important. So it's, it's really not a lack of commitment, but the degree of commitment to something that we might not be aware of or admitting to ourselves that creates what seems to be self-sabotage. Consider like the dieter who genuinely wants to eat healthier and lose weight. You know, she's committed to her goal of self-actualization, but then out of nowhere, she finds herself elbow deep in a bag of chocolate. It's happened to all of us, right? Is this just a lack of willpower or is there, is there something deeper at play? Let's dig a little bit deeper. What happens if the chocolate binge isn't about a lack of discipline, but it's a coping mechanism? Maybe she's dealing with stress in her marriage and the chocolate provides a temporary escape. It's a false sense of security that distracts her from the real issue. In this scenario, the chocolate isn't the enemy. It's a misguided attempt to meet her need for emotional safety. And here's where it gets even more interesting. Her need to feel secure is overriding her desire to self-actualize. This isn't laziness or weakness. It's a complex dance of competing needs. She doesn't need chocolate. I mean, some of you might be like, what? What, are you kidding? People need chocolate. Maybe she does, but let's just say she doesn't necessarily need chocolate. What she needs is to confront the underlying issues in her marriage, but until she becomes aware of that fact, the cycle is going to continue and the chocolate will keep beckoning her name. I know that was a little bit dramatic, but 
we've all been there. Yeah, you know, it's all too easy to explain away our behaviors with self-talk like I'm lazy, I'm weak, you know, I can't change. And sometimes these these come as automatic negative thoughts. They just pop into our head. They're a conditioned response. But what if these behaviors are actually driven by a deep-seated need for acceptance and emotional safety? So think about this for a second. Do you ever find yourself putting others' needs before your own? Okay. I, I, I can feel the hands raising. You know, because and why do we do that? Because we're afraid that if we don't meet it's before our own, they might withdraw their approval. It's not just about being liked. It's about being loved. And for many, like the loss of approval, it kind of feels like a loss it's of love itself. It's a terrifying prospect that can make us act in ways that sometimes seem irrational. You know, we see this all the time, like when we talk to people and, and they are talking about the fact that they repeatedly fail to achieve their fitness goals. I used to work with trainers and, and we would see this with clients. Once they start to dig into their behavior, however, they discovered that staying unfit, however they define that, it's actually been beneficial in some twisted way. And I know that sounds a little bit insensitive, but if it wasn't beneficial in some way, they wouldn't perpetually be in that cycle, most likely. So let's take one client, for example, who was constantly putting other people's needs before her own. This was someone who would sabotage her own weight loss attempts by letting other people's demands take precedent, by making herself indispensable to others. She was. She felt when she was indispensable and deeply needed that she was significant, right? Think about Maslow's hierarchy, the need for esteem. Like her desire to self-actualize was actually outweighed by her desire to feel loved, which created a cycle of behavior that kept her from reaching her goals. What looked like self-sabotage was in reality a way to maintain emotional safety. So you could say, well, emotional safety, right? That was, you know, that's, that's a more foundational value. Obviously, you know, that would come before self-actualization, right? But, it, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Anyway, studies on self-sabotage and emotional regulation suggest that some of these behaviors aren't just quirks, that they're deeply rooted in our most fun fundamental needs to feel safe and to feel loved, safety, belonging. So research that's published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology indicates that when people feel insecure or unloved, they're more likely to engage in behaviors that undermine their own success. And this is a way of protecting themselves from perceived threats. That's why emotional management is just as crucial as any fitness regimen, because without addressing the underlying emotional drivers, change becomes an uphill battle. Like closing the gap between goals and behavior is critical. So what is it that you can do? First, we could start by examining our own behaviors closely and scrutinizing some of the possible reasons behind it. What behaviors do you engage in that you don't like? What are the possible benefits that could cause you to act that way? Because like, believe it or not, there's going to be some sort of benefit, even if it seems completely irrational at first glance. But when you find a gap between your stated goals and your behavior, a discrepancy. Ask yourself a few questions. First is, you know, what's stopping you from having what it is you want? And this isn't about blaming yourself. It's about understanding the obstacles that are in your path. Are these external barriers or are they internal, rooted in fear and insecurity? What one behavior would you imagine as the greatest obstacle to you reaching your goals? Identify the one thing that you keep doing that's holding you back. It's usually something that you're doing to meet a different need other than the goal that, you know, you are saying that you want to fulfill. Why do you believe that you keep repeating this behavior? Now, be brutally honest here. Is it comfort? Is it a fear of change? Is it a need for control? Understanding the why behind what we do is the first step in breaking that cycle. Another question, we're going a little bit deeper here, is what need does this behavior fulfill in you? And 
how do you even know that's true? This is where you got to dig deep. And if you don't know the answer to this at first, it's fine. Sit in it. What's the underlining need that this behavior is trying to meet? How does it serve you? Even if it's in a way that doesn't make complete sense. Even if it's in a way that's a little bit twisted. How does it serve you? Another question is, who would you be without this behavior? This is a powerful question because it forces you to confront the possibility of change. If you were to let go of this behavior, what would you gain? And if you were to let go of this behavior, what would you lose? What other way could you fill that need? You know, maybe get out a pen and paper and, and like brainstorm healthier, more productive ways to meet that need than is currently being satisfied by this behavior that's, well, not all that constructive. And this could be anything from seeking support to finding new coping mechanisms. Now the question is, what need does this behavior deprive you of? Every behavior has consequences, obviously. You know, what are the sacrifices that you're making by holding on to this one behavior or this one habit? And how's that impacting other areas of your life? You know, so this might be causing a little bit of strife between you and your partner. Well, you're, you're an integrated whole. You're not this compartmentalized system. So it's affecting things at home. How's it affecting things at work? What about socially? You know, how's it going to affect you a year from now? Two? And when you reach your goal, what needs will that achievement help you fulfill? I mean, th this could be the light at the end of the tunnel question. Visualize how achieving your goal will not only change your behavior, but also meet your deeper needs, maybe in a more fulfilling way, in, in a way that, you know, is a bit healthier for you. So now let's talk about the best version of you. What does that even look like? And more importantly, why do you want to become that person? You know, so when I would ask clients about their goals, whether it was losing weight, fit, or, or currently as a coach, improving some area of performance in their life, I'm often intrigued by how much of a struggle it is to answer why they want to achieve these things. At first, anyway. I mean, it's almost as if that there's always a reason, but they're not aware of it. As if they set these goals because they think they should, but not because on some level they're deeply connected to them. But here's the kicker. If you're not clear about why you're doing something, even if you achieve it, you might end up feeling disappointed. Imagine someone who's absolutely convinced that weight loss is going to solve all their problems. And then they go ahead and they work really hard. They get there. They hit their target weight, but their life hasn't magically improved because their unhappiness really wasn't about the weight in the first place. And this could be a huge letdown, like leading to maybe enough discouragement to make them give up on other goals because like weight loss is difficult. It requires a lot of holistic strategies. And it requires time. It requires sustained efforts and setbacks. And, and maybe, like, w when you look at this, this wasn't a single isolated event. Maybe you start to frame other goals in this life. Well, what's the use? Because oh, I'm going to work on this. And, you know, even if I do achieve it, it won't be satisfying when I get there. So studies published in Psychological Science show that when people achieve goals that are misaligned with their true values and needs, they often experience what can be framed as goal disengagement, meaning they lose motivation and abandon the goal. And this happens because the achievement doesn't provide the emotional satisfaction they were expecting. Like, think about that. When reality is not nearly as rewarding as the expectations, our dopamine levels lower. So when you understand what, what needs your behavior is trying to meet, you start to understand what you really need. So once you understand that, it's much easier to change your behavior, or if not easier, but it's much more likely that you'll have the sustained effort and commitment that results in that behavior change. And this isn't really about willpower. Don't get that statement mixed up. It's about alignment. 
It's about making sure that your actions are serving your true needs, not just your surface level desires. So the next time you find yourself reaching for that ice cream, ask yourself, what do I really need right now? Because ice cream's not the problem, right? It's reaching for ice cream and not understanding the real reason why. Because another question, again, that might be powerful in these instances is how can I give myself that without sabotaging my goals or, or without sabotaging the behaviors that I want to engage in right now? If you want that ice cream, go for it. But if you want something else and you're reaching for that ice cream, investigate a little bit further. Because when you align your behavior with your true needs, change isn't possible. It becomes inevitable. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future.